Jane Ailey. Welcome, um, Implementation Board. This is the regular meeting of the Implementation Board, part of the King County Regional Homeless Authority. Um, with that, I call this meeting to order and ask Naomi if she'll take a roll call. Thank you, Harold. Uh, Carrie Anderson. Nate Caminos. Here. Paula Carvalho. Here. John Chalmanak. Gordon McHenry. Present. Harold Odom. Present. Damian Patnall. Here. Adrian Quinn. Here. Michael Ramos. Here. Sarah Rankin. Simha Reddy. Here. And Juanita Spotted Elk. Uh, just to let the record reflect that Juanita will be present and will join shortly. We do have quorum. Thank you, Naomi. I just want to say thank you to everyone who's shown up and those coming on to this meeting. A year ago, I had COVID and um, our co-chair, um, co former co-chair, Nate took over for a month or so, and I'm sure he was bogged down with a lot of stuff. I just want to say thank you, Nate, and um, welcome to uh, Simha, who is our new co-chair for the King County Regional Homeless Authority Implementation Board. And I thank all of you for being so uh, cooperative in, in ask, answering our questions and about committees this week. Um, we really wanna get those started. So it just a reminder that we are uh, gonna be under the Open Meetings Act that everything you say, write, or any communication within this meeting is recorded. Um, with that, they, um, Simha, would you like to um, make the, uh, an, um, Agenda. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Thanks, Earl. Um, you know, I'd, I'd like to propose uh, before we get started, uh, two small amendments to the agenda for today. Um, the first is that uh, Seattle City Council uh, member uh, Teresa Mosqueda um, kindly asked to, to uh, join us today and share some of her thoughts on the budget. Um, we're hoping to give her around 10 minutes right after the uh, time of public comment. Um, the uh, second uh, addition I'd, I'd ask to, for the agenda is um, given the surge in uh, COVID, uh, just a, a brief update from uh, the RHA team if they can um, about uh, the COVID-19 response to Omicron, uh, to, to Omicron among the homeless service providers. Um, maybe uh, to occur right after the severe weather shelter discussion. Um, would anybody, anybody be willing to, uh, well, I'll propose that if anyone would be willing to second that as. Um, I'll you know, second. Thank you. And if we can do just a voice vote, um, everyone in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Any abstentions? Thank you. So, uh, Naomi, if you can uh, make sure that agenda, uh, amended agenda eventually ends up on the website, that'd be fantastic. Thank you. Thank you, Simon. As we've done um, for the last, I think, eight months now, and I really appreciate your vote of confidence in making sure this continues to go forward, Paula Cavallo will be doing a presentation on land acknowledgement today. Paula, I'll turn it over to you. Yep. Um, so I'm going to read a land acknowledgement. Um, I um, helped support the creation of this when I was at the Mockingbird Society, um, which is an advocacy agency working with young people who've experienced homelessness and foster care. Um, I just ask that you take this into consideration um, that they are also a statewide organization. So instead of changing um, their equity state or their land acknowledgement, I'm just going to read it as is. Um, so it says, I would like to acknowledge that we are on the traditional lands of the Coast Salish, Interior Salish, and Yakima Nation tribes, and to thank them for allowing us onto their land. They took care of this land before it was colonized, and they continue to care for, honor, and defend their land. We honor with gratitude the land itself and all of the Native tribes of Washington State. 
Um, I would also like to acknowledge the historical and systemic exploitation and oppression of indigenous peoples, enslaved Africans, and other historically underinvested people, which has led to the disproportionality and representation of these communities among those we serve and whose voices we seek to elevate. I ask that we keep this in mind as we work to transform the systems that have and continue to impact us. Um, so special thank out, thanks to Mockingbird for allowing me to read this. And I'll thank you, bring Paul. it back to you, Harold. Thank you very much. Um, and thank Mockingbird for allowing us to have that. Um, and I'll be calling on more people um, in the future to um, give their um, land acknowledgement of how they want to present it. And I think the um, land acknowledgement that we previously had was short, a little short of um, being sincere and authentic. So we'll have 10 minutes of public comment that will be starting in a little bit. We're a little bit behind schedule, so we'll be having 10 minutes of public comment, but also we'll be having Muscada in there as well. Um, and just a reminder about public comment that we're gonna open the chat now. So if you are here and you wish to have public comment, please enter your name and the city you're calling from into the chat. And we'll go from there. And Simha, I will turn it over to you for the consent agreement. But you're still on mute. Well, uh, on our consent agenda, uh, we're seeking board approval for the draft minutes from the um, uh, December um, uh, meeting. And I'm going to I think we've all had, hopefully had a chance to review that. Um, is there a motion to approve the December meeting minutes? So moved. Seconded. Seconded. Thank you. Um, all in favor to approve, uh, please vote by saying aye. 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 All opposed? And any abstentions? This is Damien, I'm going to abstain. Thank you, Damien. Um, Maybe if you can reflect that the December draft minutes are approved with one abstention. Um, thank you. And let the record yeah. show that um, Juanita Spotted L is here and Pastor Kerry have come into the room. Welcome, thank you. Uh, next, we're gonna move into actually our public um, comment period. We have about 10 minutes for public comment. If you wish to comment, as Harold mentioned, and you haven't already typed your name and city into the chat box, please do so now. Um, each individual will get two minutes to comment and will be unmuted and called on in that order that their names were entered into the chat. Uh, when you reach the end of your two minutes, we'll ask you to finish your comments so that others may speak too. And I'll close uh, public comment at uh, 2.27. That'll be 10 minutes from now. And public comment is now open. All right. Hi, Simha. Um, it looks like we have one person who would like to comment, Bill Curlin Hackett from Auburn, Washington. Please go ahead. Bill, you should be unmuted. Thank you. Hello, members of the Implementation Board. Uh, I am working on getting other people to sit through these meetings and comment, so uh, I hope I end up not being the one commenting each month. Um, I want to. I, I noticed it's agenda items that we're supposed to comment on, and I do have two things, uh, but I want to preface it by saying thanks to the RHA, to staff, uh, to all of you who are part of boards for uh, ramping up. Um, in one meeting I was in at the start of the uh, New Year, I thanked Peter Lynn and gave him a happy birthday, uh, because that is where you are. Um, we've started a vehicle residency work group with the help of staff. Um, we've got subcommittees. Um, I, I don't know how many of you actually know about that. I know that there's a testimony of some kind set for Monday. Maybe you'll hear more about it, but I would invite you to get us on your agenda since we use the RHA name. Um, I want to remind you that half of the unsheltered in King County by the last numbers we have are living in vehicles and that it has been the most underwhelming response over the many years. Uh, I want to respond about the severe weather. We did address that in the vehicle residency. We made some headway, but even working with Alexis and others, the preponderance of the response to severe weather was for not people living in vehicles. 
Um, and that's because historically no one has done work around people and vehicles. So all the work Alexis did, which was very profound and used many regional assets, uh, very little of it went to people and vehicles. And we had some terrible circumstances evolve. Uh, one of them was pointed out to us by the RV remediation team. And if you don't know what that is, you can ask me a question after I stop. But it was a man who was suffering frostbite, didn't have any clothes on, had been four days without water in his RV. And if they hadn't pointed them out to us, he would have died. Uh, the other thing I want to bring up is that on the committee, on the agenda is subcommittees. We absolutely need to be recognized and have a, someone who is a staffer contracted uh, one foot in our committee process and our outreach and one foot in the RHA. Uh, it's great to have a vehicle residency work group, but it can't be directed by someone who just convenes it for RHA. And otherwise we're just not connected to you. So I hope those will be things you address. Thanks. Thank you so much, Bill, for your comments. Um, it looks like we have another uh, speaker as well. Is that Iris? Iris, you should be unmuted. Oh, not yet. We can't hear you. Right. Um, it looks like Iris may be having some difficulties with the um, uh, well, technical difficulties with sound. Yes, yeah. uh, okay, questions here, around um, vouchers. I'm fine, thanks. Oh. I think it might make sense for us to make sure that staff have a chance to follow up with her. So thank at, you for that. At this time, we have no other public commenters. I think there was one other, uh, Karina O'Malley. Oh, I see Karina. Sorry about that, Karina. Um, okay, Karina, you should be unmuted now. There it is. I found an unmute button. It just appeared magically. Hi. <laughs> you can hear me now? Yes. Excellent. So I'm Karina O'Malley. I run a safe parking program out of my church, like Washington United Methodist Church in Kirkland, Washington. And I'm sorry I, I came into this meeting um, not well prepared, but I did want to say hi and thank you for your work and uh, just give you my experience from my uh, working with RHA over the last few months. And Publicola had an article, if you didn't see it, I urge you to look for it, about a shelter in West Seattle. And I just feel very uh, connected to that story because what it was is somebody like me who was just using the resources they had in front of them to help people who were living outside um, and managed to get a tiny bit of funding from uh, the system over the emergency weather event, and then was inundated with just an overwhelming need that they couldn't answer with, you know, what they were working with. And it's, it's a, a heart-rending story. And I just, I wanted to connect that to my own experience, which is I am incredibly grateful for the uh, innovative ways that RHA used their emergency housing vouchers. My program, which doesn't have any government funding, we don't have any staff, um, was able to get some emergency housing vouchers. We've actually leased up six people, which is pretty impressive considering how few people have leased up um, in the whole system. But um, it's an unfunded case management need that I am really struggling to try to figure out how to meet 
in the next year for these folks that I've leased up and we don't have staff people and it's volunteer faith-based. And um, I'm hoping that as an implementation board, you look at creative ways that you don't overwhelm volunteer organizations, but also support them. So thanks. Thank you so much for that. I appreciate that. Uh, and Naomi, do we have anyone else who uh, wanted to weigh in? Um, not that I can see in this moment. I see that Council Member Mosqueda has um, her hand raised. Oh, wonderful. Uh, well, we will, uh, so we've reached the allotted, well, we've uh, completed our public comment period then. If there are no new comments, um, for anyone who didn't have an opportunity to provide comment, you can leave the chat window open. Um, the, um, but we'd like to now- uh, Osema? Yeah. Sorry, it's Gordon McHenry. Um, Thanks, Gordon. Yeah, sure. okay. yeah, no, looking forward to hearing from Councilmember Mosqueda, but I, I wanted to ask a question if you would allow. Uh, Bill Curlin Hackett had given public input uh, at the very beginning, and Bill, you, you, if he's still on, you use we a lot in your presentation, and I just wanted to hear from him uh, the um, who is the we in terms of like uh, an association, <laughs> uh, affiliation, so because. Uh, yeah, so that's my question. If, if I could have that clarification from Bill Curlin Hackett, that appreciate it. Thank, thanks, Gordon. I, I'm sitting here laughing a little bit. We thinking the French, yes. Um, <laughs> yes, thank you for asking the question. Um, the we is right now the King County, uh, well, let's say the Regional Homelessness Authority uh, Vehicle Residency Work Group that has been started by RHA staff. It's convened by RHA staff, but RHA staff really isn't expert in the work we're doing per se, but they're doing a great job convening. In fact, I'll say it's Naomi. Uh, Naomi's gone overboard in convening this. So thanks to her and of course the staff that have supported her to do that. But the we, I think really uh, we're now funded by RHA, a program that we had last year. And thanks to council member Mosqueda for her support uh, the, the last, I'll say two years counting this year. Um, so we are an RHA program doing uh, vehicle residency outreach and Scofla as part of that. Um, we're looking at other uh, groups like REACH, which is much bigger than we are, now doing direct intentional outreach to people and vehicles. So we're trying to build a community of coordinated outreach and colleagues and collaboration um, around what's been our most underfunded mandate, which is people and vehicles. So uh, I'm very appreciative that we have this group. Um, as I said, we're gonna need some people with some feet into RHA. We can't just continue to respond for those who are convening the meeting. Um, it's countywide, Karina is part of it. Karina, who you just heard from, we're part of the interim infrastructure. In other words, find places where safe vehicle, safe, safe lots for vehicles of all kinds, RVs. So we have a lot that we can share with this. And I, I just know Harold's been part of it too. Thank you. And Simha, you've written me. Thank you for that. Um, and we will push back a little bit because we're seeing it in the field. Don Shepard is, is an expert on this out of reach. Uh, the RV remediation team is still working out of Seattle. What they do is come in and clean up areas and they don't impound the RVs. We've got great working agreements with parking enforcement um, and with others with the clean out of the RVs through Chris Wilkerson and public utilities. These are limited to Seattle though. And, and as you know, this is region wide. Mm -hmm. um, Tina Lewis is doing great work for the Salvation Army on the south end of the county, but she's a lone ranger. Um, and the east side has a vehicle residency outreach worker. There's a lot to do. And, and I think you know, uh, especially Gordon and others of you who've been involved, um, how underfunded this has been. Uh, I, I'd say you know, 99% of the money goes to people who are not living in vehicles. Um, and that is something I know Mark and Peter and others and Lisa are ready to change. Um, but you folks are, you're driving the train, <laughs> you know, and I, I've watched you all for years. Um, and this is the group that drives the train. So I just hope that you will be very proactive. Thanks. Appreciate the clarification. And thank you, Sema. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, Gordon. Um, we'll, we, uh, let's take a moment. And... Before we go on to... Um, um, Mus um, Council Member Mosquita, I, I would just like the group to think about maybe having a, a public testimony by Mr. Hackett and several other people from the um, vehicle safe lots, if not next month, the month after that, by March, having a vehicle uh, 
residency testimony. So we have a, a broader and a more in-depth view of where we're, where we're at with this. So just think about that, maybe we can take a vote at the end, see how we do. But go ahead, Simone, let's go. Um, well, I wanted to take a moment and uh, welcome uh, Councilmember Mosqueda to the RHA meeting today. We're so glad to have you here and um, want to give you some time to share with us your thoughts. Thank you very much. Uh, do you get the chance to see me too? I don't know if I can come on screen to say hello here, but if you can hear me, that's fantastic. Okay. We can hear you, which is great. Well, it's wonderful to be here. Um, semi in person to see you to say happy new year to say thank you um, for all of the work that you do um, mr chair wonderful to be here thanks for the opportunity to join you all and i've had the chance to work with many of the board members so it's wonderful to see you on the screen here today um, i did share a powerpoint presentation just very brief with like six or seven slides on it to illuminate some of the points so um, if it's possible to share that screen um, and have uh, that shared on the screen, that would be wonderful. Would you like me to do that, Mr. Chair? I don't actually think I can do that. It shows a little error sign on my end. It might be my computer. So um, I'm happy to make some opening comments if it's possible. Oh, there we go. You know, um, someone has shared it with me uh, to share my screen, but unfortunately, I don't think my computer allows me to. Is there the possibility, Mr. Chair, that someone on uh, the team side could share that? Yeah, um, I believe we have a copy of it. And if you give me two seconds to pull it up, I will share my screen. Hello, Executive Director Dones. It's good to see you. Good to see you, Council Member. Um, well, thank you again for the opportunity. And it's really wonderful to be here. I appreciate the, the team effort here on the um, PowerPoint slide. Uh, it's wonderful to see so many familiar faces. I've had the chance to work with uh, board members Caminos, Ramos, Rankins, um, McHenry Jr., uh, Pastor Carey. It's good to see all of you uh, in, um, in person here. And I just wanted to say thank you for the folks that I haven't had the chance to meet with yet. Um, I'm really, really excited about the work that you all are doing and the work ahead of us. Um, in the city, in this region, with in partnership with the King County Regional Homelessness Authority. Um, I am so thankful I had a conversation in December, uh, obviously with um, Director Dones and with others about the ways in which we all are excited about working together in 2022. And with some of the board members um, just asked, hey, would it be possible to pop in and provide a brief overview of some of the things that we included um, from Seattle City Council and from the executive um, as we created the 2022 budget, recognizing this was the first year that the Regional Homelessness Authority truly had the reins on implementation of all things homelessness, homeless services uh, in Seattle. So I'm thrilled to be here and know that you have a full agenda. I'll keep my comments relatively short. And I just think it's uh, such important timing, given the conversation you're about to have today on the budget. Uh, just a few brief notes of sort of grounding on where I come from. Um, and I think uh, Director Dones will, will note this as well. Um, when Mark had come over to help steer the ship towards creating the Regional Homelessness Authority in an in its infancy in terms of ideas. It was myself, then Council Member Bagshaw, and then Council Member um, O'Brien, who worked with King County and the um, regional cities to try to help craft the policy that would go into place. And I know that there was so many meetings that I wasn't even a part of, but we met at least on a monthly basis, if not more, to talk about the implementation. Um, starting up the Regional Homelessness Authority is a priority for me, uh, because I see this as the the, the public health crisis that needed to be addressed before the current pandemic. We have compounding public health crises and you all are on the front line with implementing the solutions uh, to addressing homelessness and in partnership with the work that we're doing on housing. I know that this public health crisis is in good hands with the implementation board here. I'm also um, really proud of the work that we did to set up the board. And to me, that means seeing it through with making sure that you have a good partner in Seattle, um, that in our region, we continue to highlight the work that you all are doing um, to make sure that we are following through on what the original goals were in that legislative uh, proposal and know that it can't be done without the issue experts and the lived experience uh, that you all bring to the implementation board. 
So for me, this is really um, just a moment to say thank you. Um, I did have the chance, for example, to go down to Los Angeles when we were looking at various models and see how a functioning regional authority can work to talk to our partners in Portland at the county and understand how they're pulling together resources. And you know, we're not alone across the country in large metropolitan areas that are dealing with the crisis of lack of access to affordable housing, insufficient numbers of shelter. And I know that we will be a leader though in not only responding to the existing crises, but also with coming up with bigger, bolder, better solutions. The three Bs that I talked to uh, Director Dones about, which I know are in the hopper and coming soon. As we transition though, in this uh, from 2021 to 2022, there are some areas that are carrying over, some of which I know you discussed in your committee meeting uh, last year in December. And in thinking through how we create continuity of services, how we ensure that um, some of those great services that um, uh, Chair Harold mentioned when you talked about having the Scofflaw mitigation group come? How do we make sure that no services that are currently out there fall through the gaps as we create bigger, bolder, better, more comprehensive and integrated solutions? Um, I'm just so thrilled about the partnership that we have leading from 2021 to 2022. Um, and I think that this is also an opportunity for us to provide additional information, you know, whether it was misinformation or misrepresentation from some of the reports that we saw about what the city had done. I think this is a great opportunity for us to, to fill in the gaps and provide additional information about what uh, specifically the city has done to support regional homelessness authority and where I am optimistic that we will continue to do even more in 2022 and beyond. Um, if you want to go to the next slide, I think folks know I, I, I get into the weeds really easy. So I loved looking at your PowerPoint presentation and I will not steal any of the thunder from the upcoming presentation. Um, but in the weeds and in the implementation details is where I love to live. Folks might know that from our previous work when I was on the implementation efforts for the Affordable Care Act uh, Exchange Board or implementing health coverage for all kids or implementing um, uh, so many policies that we passed in Olympia together. I love implementation, but I have to recognize that as a council member now, I don't get to do the implementation work. We obviously hold the purse strings when it comes to budget, we pass legislation into policy, but I want to be there in good partnership with you to make sure that the implementation truly works and that we make tweaks um, and enhance budgets where necessary so that uh, the work really matters. Um, there's been a lot of questions, uh, I think, in, in especially in December, late November, when the budget was finalized at the city level to ask, you know, had Seattle stepped up and provided services? And I think as you look at your total budget, one of the things I wanted to call out is that Seattle's funding makes up about 68% of the total funding for the Regional Homelessness Authority at this moment. I'm not, I don't want to brag because I don't want that to be a longstanding tradition. We'd love to see that funding source diversify. And I know that that's a goal of yours as well. Um, 115 of the approximately $170 million budget um, does come from Seattle. And I just wanted to call that out to show that if two thirds of the funding is coming from Seattle, I do think that this is a strong commitment from the city to make sure that the Regional Homelessness Authority has support that it needs now and as it continues to grow in both approach and solutions um, in the future. Um, also important to note, you know, there was a lot of conversation about homelessness in this last year as it related to the election and a lot of conversation about the Compassion Seattle Initiative where folks were saying, you know, if they were supportive of it, 12% of the funding would have gone to support homeless services. And if you look at our total Seattle budget right now, approximately 12% of our existing budget is going into homeless services. So I wanted to draw that out to make sure that folks see overall how we are doing with um, applying dollars from Seattle towards addressing this, this most pressing crisis. Additionally, um, you might know that um, in, in addition to these items, 115 million, we did add additional dollars that go towards providing services for folks who are experiencing homelessness. This includes funding for um, uh, Clean Cities Initiative. You can go to the next slide. Uh, Clean Cities Initiative. It includes funding for the human service provider contracts. It includes funding to make sure that we're partnering with King County uh, to stand up the um, high acuity shelter that we so desperately need and was identified as a priority from the Regional Homelessness Authority. That 5 million, for example, is being paired in partnership with 5 million from the county for site acquisition and control so that we can stand up a high acuity shelter. And I've talked to uh, King County recently about the additional service funds that are going to continue to come with that. So that was a really big priority for us to make sure that we invested. Um, and in addition to the 115 that was just mentioned before, there's a total of um, 
$6.2 million that's going into Clean Cities Initiative. This is making sure that our city has um, funding year round, not just for half the year, but going into making sure that as we find places for folks to live indoors or appropriate shelter, that we're also making sure that we're activating parks and public spaces as well. On this slide, it actually includes some of the important pieces that we knew from the um, King County Regional Homelessness Authority that were critically important, um, but were uh, also you know, not able to go along with the initial resolution that the county and the city passed together because there was no creation of the RHA in terms of staff and, and infrastructure in the early spring. That all came because of your great director coming on in the spring and coming together and pulling together people and hiring. And as soon as, as humanly possible, providing recommendations to the city, that will all be different going forward. So instead of receiving recommendations in October uh, from a budget that we've received from the mayor already. I believe the plan is in April, right? In the spring for those budget recommendations to start coming forward and there were to, there to be early conversations about what the Regional Homelessness Authority needs. Um, we were in the midst of receiving the budget. Again, the mayor proposes the budget, right? Just like the state legislature, they just received the proposed budget from the governor and now it's up to the state legislature to finalize the budget. Um, they, uh, we received the budget from the mayor in September. In October, we got news that we were about 50 $15 million in a revenue shortfall. Simultaneously, we also received uh, requests for additional support from the Regional Homelessness Authority. So we worked really hard to balance both needing to address a deficit in our revenue and the need for additional services, both for administrative costs um, for standing up at high acuity shelter and for doing um, what we could to respond to the peer navigator um, uh, request as well. On this slide, it shows, as your slides we'll talk about in just a minute, um, a combined total of over $1.4 million for the administration, fully funded, $5 million that again gets coupled with the $5 million from King County for site acquisition and control and much more to come for services for a high acuity shelter and much bigger vision. I know Mark is thinking through what can be done on that site, which we're really excited excited about. Um, a statement of legislative trend, uh, intent in the truest sense, uh, an intent to work with our um, city and um, the community partners and regional homelessness authority to come up with and broaden existing peer navigator systems, but to try to make sure that we were addressing all of the pressing crises at the moment, given the revenue shortfall had sort of put a um, pin in coming back to make sure that there was additional funding for that item, but truly a statement of legislative intent to work together. And as I mentioned, this, um, in addition to the $115 million, um, various other items totaled up about $158 million going into homelessness and homelessness services. Um, on the next slide, you will see um, some of those pieces that I noted that were um, critical for us, I think, to feature as um, council additions, and some of these I know you've already talked about, but one that hasn't gotten a lot of attention um, in the media and something that I think you know we have a lot of shared interest in is stability for our human service providers. I know when Mark was providing a presentation to city council, I think it was maybe August or even July, it was, it was like mid-year and we were all thinking about the upcoming budget. We can't think about the upcoming budget and how to make investments if we have a workforce that's still experiencing 40% turnover, 30% vacancy. And so working to try to stabilize the um, human service providers is something that's been a big priority for me. Three years ago, we provided a cost of living increase that hadn't been done in 10 years. This year, we said in addition to that cost of living increase, we actually need to provide an additional appreciation amount to bring the uh, cost of living from 2.8% up to 5.8. That's one time in nature at that higher level but an effort to try to stabilize the workforce there. This slide also notes the investments that we made in um, the Clean Cities Initiative and really trying to make sure that we are clear about the ongoing investments in, um, in the services that will go along with um, Office of Housing. Office of Housing is gonna receive over 7 million for uh, permanent supportive housing and affordable housing services through the emergency housing vouchers. King County Regional Homelessness Authority is slated to receive a portion of those services of funding for emergency housing vouchers through a contract or a contract amendment that is being worked on with the Office of Housing as I understand right now. This is really critical. While it's not the, the, it's not, uh, the end all be all because we know we need additional 
additional housing, not just housing vouchers. We need to build additional housing. If we can't have folks stabilized, we know that they're at risk of uh, circling back out. Uh, the next slide, if you will, this just features um, a few of the things that um, are not directly going to the Regional Homelessness Authority, but are critically important for providing that network of services. Um, I don't see the next slide yet, but it includes the provider pay, the acuity shelter, the emergency housing vouchers, thank you so much, um, that are all treated as sort of separate from the traditional dollars, or I should say the dollars that are going to directly to the Regional Homelessness Authority, but I think are really important to call out for the work that they will have, the impact that they will have on 2022 activities, and will later be transitioned to the Regional Homelessness Authority um, at a date here in the near future, as I understand it. And my second to last slide is about housing. Uh, I know there's folks here who work closely on housing um, uh, expansion, affordable housing priorities. The third door I know is represented in this room as well. We can't talk about homelessness and solutions to those who are experiencing homelessness without talking about housing. And I'm really proud to have led the effort on Jumpstart Seattle last year. Uh, about 68% of that funding goes to building affordable housing. Because of that, we were able to take the traditional investment of about $90 million and double that to $194 million going into affordable housing, which also includes funding for permanent supportive housing services. Um, and uh, I know, um, Director Dones, you talk a lot about, you know, that throughput, what we've heard a lot of that, that presentation. And this, to me, is the slide that really emphasizes it's not just about expanding shelters, the type of sheltering uh, uh, and temporary housing, because I know you all are thinking about really innovative solutions there. But it's also that next step that I hear you all talk about a lot, which is the throughput to make sure folks actually have a place to call home. Uh, so this housing uh, slide to me is, is something that I'm um, extremely proud of in addition to the 158 million going into homelessness services. Um, and I think my last slide is just this. Um, oh, excuse me. This is a, a quick, quick note as well that we also have Clifford funds. These are the coronavirus local uh, funding relief dollars that are transitioning. They were previously at the city department, transitioning to regional homelessness authority in many ways. Um, this is embedded in the 2022 budget. I think this is an area where we're going to continue to see um, a lot of excitement for the Regional Homelessness Authority to have their reins on it so that the, the implementation and the trajectory of these pro, uh, uh, programs and services and the ways in which they you know, evolve in the future and get integrated, this is all going to be now um, coordinated by RHA going forward. And I think you know this, this slide will is a marker of what was invested in in July of 2021. And as we think about those bigger, bolder, broader integrated investments in the future, there will be greater cohesion. And, and while there will still be line items, hopefully from our federal government and our state government, in addition to city and county dollars, um, you will see how these items now with, I think the handing over to the RHA really are going to be integrated into the overall approach. And then my last slide. Um, my last slide is just that we're all in this together. Um, you know, we have Here's a quote from the incoming mayor, which we're really excited about, you know, looking forward and working together uh, with the mayor, with the county, with RHA, with our state legislative partners, with a congressional delegation that's been truly responsive to the need of, of, of COVID and the crisis um, that's been created, both economic um, and housing instability. And I think that by working together, by recognizing we're all in the same boat, and looking forward to integrate both our funding streams and our program services, uh, we are, will be better positioned. I'm really excited that, you know, last year was a little bit of an outlier, right? Economic downturn plus receiving the um, request in October meant that we really tried to scramble to provide direct investments where possible and ensure there was that continuity of services. I think working together, you know, starting in April when you all come up with your recommendations, we'll see a different um, sort of uh, synergy with how the final budget looks, if if that's fair to say, Director Dones. I saw you had given the thumbs up in terms of the timing, but again, thank you for the opportunity to be here. Uh, obviously, I, it took a little bit longer than I thought I would, um, but happy to answer any questions, and um, thank you for the work that you do to respond to these public health crises simultaneously. Thank you so much, uh, Councilman Mosqueda. Um, I do want to be thoughtful about uh, our time together as a board and, and our need to talk about the budget, but does anyone have a question for Councilman Mosqueda? Oh, Adrian? Uh, just a quick 
thank you uh, to Council, uh, Councilmember Mosqueda and the City of Seattle for the investment um, in, in homelessness and also for the leadership on trying to raise the salaries for people who are in the human service sector. I just can't emphasize how critically important that is to, um, to the success of programs in this region. And so if we can also get other, other uh, sector, uh, other government agencies to get involved in that as well. I think what I look at is the benchmark is that, you know, uh, the step one police salary is $83,000 a year and our uh, navigators and behavioral health specialists are working with that same population, making substantially less. And, and so if we can make that our target, I think we could see uh, a great change um, and less turnover in the community. So thank you for your leadership on that and so many things. Thank you. And thanks to your leadership as well in the community for all the work that you do. Um, when we tried to pass the cost of living increase three years ago, I, I still have battle scars from that effort. And it's, it just makes so much sense. You know, folks hadn't had a cost of living increase in 10 years in that sector. And with a master's degree in chemical dependency, they were starting with a salary of $33,000 to live in the city of Seattle. That just doesn't make sense. So uh, very excited about the uh, COLA increase that we accomplished in statute. And then this one-time enhancement as well is gonna go a long way, I appreciate it. Um, Harold, so maybe we can make this our last question or comment if possible, thanks. I don't wanna throw any water on this great fire that we're going through right now. Uh, this country is going through a reckoning I just thank uh, Council Member Skater for coming over and, and giving a good uh, outlay of what's going on. And thank you very much. You will have um, some other fires to put out um, <laughs> in the coming year. And uh, just because we are going to be forced to be reckoned with, we really want to stand up and we really want to make a significant dent in homelessness. Uh, we're all committed to that and we're going to be going forward in that. So we look for some more conversations and some maybe some battle wounds to um, have fun with this. <laughs> so. That sounds good. I know we're all the better for it when we work together. So I really appreciate it and um, really appreciate your comments as well about the Scoff Law Mitigation Group. I look forward to hearing more from that future discussion and I'm free anytime you all want to chat. Well, thank you so much, Councilman Mosqueda. Really appreciate your taking the time to be with us today. And Everybody, I think Mark had something there too before we let Council Member go. Is that right, Mark? Just briefly, thank you, uh, uh, Council Member Skeda. Thank you for coming. I I uh, feel obligated. Uh, I talk to the providers every day. Um, thank you for your work and your leadership on that that cost of living work and that salary adjustment. Um, I want to be clear for members of this board and members of the public our frontline staff cannot sustain at the wages that they are at. It is not possible. Um, and in the, the um, you know, the combination of the severe, severe weather event and COVID um, has caused a massive hemorrhaging across frontline staff. And the most commonly cited thing is like, you know, they're being asked to do everything and they're not being paid accordingly. Um, and so I, I'm really grateful to uh, the council members leadership and really hope that we as a community can do better by these folks. Thank you so much. And um, I failed to mention this was the one time investment. We also included in last year's budget a, uh, a study for the longer term wage stability. So actually looking at a wage analysis to bring those um, contracts up so that folks can get uh, the funding year over year at the actual wages that they should be paid for greater stability. Really appreciate your comments, Director Dones. And I just wanna say thanks to your team as well. The team in RHA has been fantastic. Um, and this all at the city wouldn't be possible without Jeff Sims from Central Staff, uh, who's been really engaged with all of you. And um, we appreciate the partnership. And I know you know we can, we can spend a lot of time working on a resolution. We can pass into policy and into law uh, the work, but it, it doesn't mean anything if it's not implemented the right way. And so, so thankful for all the work you do. And again, you know, questions, concerns, ideas, let's all um, chat anytime. I'll put my contact information in the chat here and I'll let you get back to the robust meeting you have. But thank you for all the work you do. And uh, in 2022, um, there's nothing more important for us to do than make sure people have a place to call home so that we can all stay home to stay healthy if needed. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. And to the city of Seattle as well. Thanks. I'll pass it on. <laughs> um, well, now for the, uh, we're a little bit late getting into it, but uh, we're going to have an opportunity now to hear from the KCRHA staff.
regarding uh, the final 2022 budget. I know we had some discussion around this last meeting. Um, and then subsequent to that, we'll be taking a vote on the, that budget today. So let's pay close attention. Um, Meg, are you gonna be leading us through this? Actually, um, Tiffany Brooks, our finance oh. director is gonna be doing the presentation. Fantastic. So I will turn it over to her. Tiffany, Hi welcome. everyone. Thank you. Give me one moment to share my screen and I will go off camera because I'm sharing from a different screen that's on the other side. Okay, can everyone see my screen? Yes, we can. Thank you. Perfect. All right, so we're going to go through our final 2022 budget. Um, and uh, afterwards, we do have three action items to go over. One would be the approval for the final budget. The second will be to um, have a discussion over how to um, policy-wise handle uh, provisos and earmarks. And Mark will handle that discussion towards the end of the presentation. So as you guys have already seen, this is an overview of the percentage of where our budget is going. We have approximately 69% of our budget going towards continued programs that are coming from the city of Seattle and King County. We have 23% that will be coming from new funding and other funding sources, and then 7.5% going towards our admin and operations. As you've seen previously, um, when Meg presented back in December, this slide has been slightly modified to match what we have in our current MSAs with both the city and the county. The top portion for continued programs has not changed because we are continuing programs as they were in 2021 on into 2022 with the same funding, plus their one time, their COLA that they will be receiving from the city of Seattle and um, this amount will be increased um, in the near future to include the additional one-time COLA that Council Member Mosqueda just mentioned as well. However, those dollars are not included in our budget right now because they are not currently in our MSA and that will be notated later on in a further slide. This next section is for new programs and other funding. This first line was revised. It did have additional dollars in here, but we decided to break it out slightly differently now that we have our MSAs so that you can clearly see the funding sources that we are receiving from the city of Seattle and any new funding sources that we are receiving from other entities. So this first side includes our council budget actions that were approved in the 2022 budget by the city of Seattle. The next slide is for our city of Seattle ESG CV dollars. This was increased um, from the previous amount that was identified now that we do have the carry forward dollars that the city of Seattle has contracted to send over to us within our signed and executed MSA. This also is the same for the CDBG, excuse me, CV dollars, and both of these are one-time COVID dollars, the ESG CV and the CDB CV dollars. The next line is for additional one-time dollars from the City of Seattle, which are the Coronavirus State and Local and Fiscal Recovery Funds, also known as Clifford dollars. And this includes multiple programs and you will see um, a slight breakdown of those dollars in another slide. During the severe weather response, um, we did receive a $50,000 grant from the United Way to help with the severe weather response and COVID response. And so we are including that in our budget since we do have a signed contract with them and those dollars on hand to help ensure that we're providing resources to providers as they request it from us to help them with the COVID surge that we're having right now. And then the last portion is for our operating costs. And it is approximately 7.53% of our overall budget. And I will go to the next slide and take any questions that anyone um, will have at the end of the presentation. This slide right here did not change from previously. Um, it is showing how many projects we received from the city of Seattle and how many projects we received from King County and then the total amount of projects that the King County Home, Regional Homelessness Authority will have overall, which we are contracting out this year and providers are in the process of 
executing their PSAs and um, working on their budgets so that we can make sure that everything is good to go come February when invoices are submitted. This slide is showing our operating costs and it has slightly increased um, due to an increase in funds, um, which we are grateful for from the city of Seattle to ensure that we were closing the gap of our need for admin costs. It is also increased slightly for um, funding that we received from our Clipper dollars that is for the support of us um, bringing on new programs and different um, initiatives that we will use those Clifford dollars for and they would need additional admin resources to help ensure that they are fully executed and brought to fruition. All right, on this slide, it is the City of Seattle's 2022 budget ads and it is broken down um, for um, the different areas that we're receiving those dollars. So we have COVID mitigation funds, we have the KCRHA admin dollars, we also have maintaining current programs. This $19 million is um, inclusive of the Clifford dollars. So it does include multi-year funding for both the Soto shelter and the Hero and Hand shelters. We also have on here the one-time provider appreciation pay, which is the percentage of the dollars that we are expecting to receive from the city of Seattle for homelessness services. And again, these dollars will be added to our budget once we receive an amended MSA for these dollars to be added to our budget. We have safe parking, villages, additional funds for admin for KCRHA, expanding programs, and current programs that we are continuing and that the city of Seattle provided additional funds for. We would also like to highlight that the city of Seattle did provide $5 million for the high acuity enhanced shelter, which will be funded to the King County um, team and then transition over to the RHA in future years. Now we would get into the provisos. Um, as mentioned previously, um, this is for more of discussion on policy, not necessarily in terms of if we're approving the budget for these provisos. The reason why I say that is because these provisos are linked to current services that are transitioning over from the city of Seattle and our full intent and our actions that we are doing right now within our contracting process and sending out our PSAs. Um, contractors and providers are already receiving these dollars as we receive them from the city of Seattle and they are being used for the full intent that we receive those dollars for. So right now we have two of them. The first one includes two, one is for 800K for $3.6 million in COVID mitigation for it to be used for youth engagement centers. And then the second one is for $10.7 million for us to ensure that those funds are going toward tiny house villages. And again, um, these funds are already going toward these projects and programs um, as we speak. This is just a breakdown of the proviso and the language of the proviso and the link. So if you um, go to the presentation in your packet, you will be able to click on this hyperlink and it will take you to the full um, language. And this is the next one with the, a snippet of the $10.7 million for tiny house villages. Uh, this is for the $9.8 million that is currently in our base funding, and then also $800,000 that is intended for two self-managing encampments. Uh, this next group of slides are for earmarks, and we um, speak to these earmarks as such as language, where it is um, language within council ads that are stating that we um, use dollars for particular programs such as, and then that particular program is identified or named. And so this again is up for discussion on policy wise um, as these funds are already going to these programs for their intended use. The first one is for $185,000 for the maintain vehicle residency and outreach program and parking offense mitigation with scofflaw mitigation. The next one is for $100,000 to expand homelessness day centers with God's Little Acre. And $980,000 is for Camp Second Chance Village Expansion and Behavior Health Services, as well as the additional operating cost that goes along with that expansion and services. 
And then this is the breakdown of the language that is included within each of these council budget actions. I will hang here for a little bit in case anyone is reading through them. Okay, and then the next one again is for God's Little Acre. And this is expanding their services um, so that they can provide additional services. This last one is for Camp Second Chance. As mentioned before, this is for them to in expand the tiny house village by 20 houses. Um, and then it is also providing the second provide the second earmark at the bottom is providing additional funding to support the operations for that expansion. And again, these dollars are already going towards that purpose um, because we are fully using our funds how we receive them and with the intent that we receive them from the city of Seattle. And now I will kick it over to Mark for our final discussion and action items. Thanks, Tiffany. Um, uh, shout out uh, to Tiffany Brooks, our finance director, um, who has done exceptional work um, throughout the entirety of this budget cycle. Um, and uh, I was delighted to be able to steal from the city of Seattle. <laughs> so thanks Seattle for that too. Uh, um, I think uh, Tiffany are, are uh, happy to answer any questions you may have. Um, the action items are uh, straightforward. Um, there is the uh, vote on the budget itself. Um, then there is a policy deliberation on the provisos uh, and earmarks. Um, uh, as we discussed last time, um, and uh, channeling uh, in particular, uh, board member Trollmanak who's not able to join today, there was some concern um, about uh, the use of provisos and earmarks. Um, and uh, in the previous discussion, uh, when, uh, when I was asked, so just to norm, when I was asked what my recommendation was, I wanna be very clear as, as Tiffany was, these don't actually impact anything for us operationally this year. They are not in conflict with our intention in any way, shape, or form. Um, and so my recommendation is not is, is certainly not to reject uh, those aspects of the budget or any aspect of the budget. Um, I think to do so would be to, to cause significant harm to the overall system function. However, at the policy level, you may wish to attach some sort of rider um, to your budget passage that to go to the governing committee to be transmitted to the city of Seattle, et cetera. Uh, expressing whatever uh, your your hopes, opinions, or or um, uh, other thoughts may be. Uh, I see that Nate has his hand raised. Nate. Yeah. Thanks, uh, Chair Reddy, and um, just big thank you to Mark, Tiffany, Meg, and the many in the KCRHA staff who really uh, got us to this point uh, here in January. You know. Just being a previous co-chair last year and working with Mark uh, and Chair Odom and others uh, in the last several months to, uh, over, over this time. And, but more specifically, I just know how much work really went into this. I think we also heard from Council Member Mosqueda and the way that she's been able to help navigate and work things through too on the city side too most recently just now. Um, but in, in this sense, I. As um, Mark just referenced, um, when I still held the gavel in our last month's meeting, uh, this, we had a lot of the conversations in regards to asking questions in regards to these provisos or earmarks to that point. So uh, appreciate your clarification there, Mark, uh, before you turn it over to us for any type of question, thoughts, comments, feedback. Uh, but where I currently sit and stand is just I feel uh, uh, that I, I echo and share your same sentiment and approach, I would be concerned we're already January 12th right now, trying to approve a 2022 budget. Obviously not ideal, uh, but in the same way, uh, I think the, the questions that we were having in December and what staff was able to provide, I think we, I, I found a lot of value in having council member Mosqueda here with us this afternoon to help provide a little bit more of a glimpse and insight, insight into the city of Seattle's perspective on what those investments will be for the authority. And I just recollect where we even were as an implementation board this time last year, 
we were still just uh, starting the interview process to even hire a CEO. Uh, and right, and as Councilmember Mosqueda, as Mark and I and others on the board had discussed in the December meeting, uh, we were hopeful that we could get to a better place uh, beyond this inaugural budget, which I hope that we pass today and the way that staff is presented with this recommendation without any additional riders to the governing committee and their meeting tomorrow uh, to pass and, and, and finalize so we can actually get to work on it. Um, is that we do focus on the next steps in spring uh, of this year in terms of the coordination with city, county, and our other funding partners in getting ready for 2023 uh, and beyond, right? And we, we obviously have a lot more of the staff and structure and resources in place. And I know that the um, attitude and energy that I was bringing that now our co-chairs both share, and we have hopefully time later this afternoon to talk about the subcommittee work and the way that us as implementation board members can work more in partnership with our KCRG staff to provide that cohesion and support in providing that guidance and vision and insight too, uh, so that we're not having a way with what this is uh, come in December and voting on budgets again next year uh, for, 20, for the 23 budget. But um, I, I just feel that the, the anything that's referenced here that has specific language to it from the city of Seattle perspective is uh, from, from the way I sit and see it is continue, continuity of care of services in the way that, it, and Mark mentioned, doesn't uh, represent any type of a direct conflict in terms of how the operations of the authority be able to do its job in 2022 is, is done. So uh, I'm hopeful and would uh, be interested in entertaining a motion later uh, or presenting a motion later that would be uh, reflective of what the SNAC recommendation is. Uh, but thanks, Chair. Thank you, Nate. And Harold? I share your um, opinion, Nate. And I, I last meeting, um, I did have some concerns, and I still have those same concerns about um, even though there, Seattle is giving a lot of money to King County Regional Homeless Authority, are we independent or do we owe them something as far as uh, any tacit amount of, yeah, we're going to do it this way or that way? Um, A or B, and, and I have faith, like I said, Mark, I have faith in you and your staff that you're gonna be independent of that um, persuasion because it is a lot of persuasion in those dollars. Um, you had some very clear plans and I, and I think you're just gonna pursue them with the, um, who are they? The peer navigators, and, and I should have told my skid we presented that in July because I was part of that presentation of the first part of it um, with public comment. Um, a lot of people would, all over the place to do the work and get the data to help move this um, entity along and have its own building, the historical building. I was just reading outside the back. There are a lot of things that went into the making of this from when you first started and we didn't get along. <laughs> we first started with three, four years ago now to seeing a fruition and it's just, it's a blessing. But we have to really, from my point of view, as on the ground that those people where we have to go to and remember that those are the ones we're helping and not be persuaded by government officials because they're not out there doing the hard outreach work, smelling the urine or know where people are crying or hear those, those voices that are so bone chilling when, you, when you're out there and you just can't get it out of your head. Um, those are the people we need to be uplifting and I, I just want this King County Regional Homeless Authority to do as much as it can not to be persuaded by those dollars. So thank you. Thank you, Harold. Um, Michael, I thought I had seen your hand for a moment. Would you like to comment or? Yes. Um, I support the package. Um, when the church council was involved in starting the first 10 year plan and homelessness, city of Seattle provided 94% of the services uh, around homelessness in the county. I think that council member Mosqueda presented well the desire for partnership. So I'm confident uh, for things moving forward. I just wanna point out with regard to the provisos that are in there, that the, the city of Seattle is conscious of some of the needs that are, that are out there that are not being uh, met. And I would point us looking forward to the state of Washington and the fact that King County as one third of the population of the state should be getting one third of the funding at least. 
in terms of the support that is there. And so I would rather look ahead to ways that we can partner with the states so that the states can support the work. With regard to the provisos, I wanna note that almost all of them are related to faith community work. And um, in the emergency that has just passed in terms of cold weather and snow, faith communities were stepping up and involved in some incredible ways in response in partnership with RHA. And so it is no small thing to have those earmarks that are enhancing services that are being provided with little uh, recompensation. So um, just to note that, that I, I see those earmarks and provisos in the spirit of partnership um, and certainly everything has to be evaluated and as RHA takes control and leadership uh, in uh, the budget in the future, uh, I'm sure that everything will be evaluated and assessed with regard to its impact for the community members that are most in need. Thanks. Thank you so much, Michael. I, I agree with uh, my colleagues who have spoken so far, and I also am supportive of the staff recommendation uh, with regard to the provisos. Um, you know, I, and I know that I have I mentioned concerns with provisos in the past, and those would only be if there is inconsistency with the uh, vision of the Regional Homeless Authority, or they're asking uh, the Regional Homeless Authority to do something that the staff feel like is outside of their area of expertise or something that would not work well. Um, my hope, uh, now that we may have more time for the budget moving forward, is to engage in early conversations, hearing staff's vision uh, for things that need to change in the budget, because um, clearly things are going to have to change. And I'd love to hear more of Mark's vision uh, on where we go to need to go forward. And undoubtedly, there will be difficult changes. And I want to be able to be supportive um, and also to, you know, for the folks on this uh, implementation board to also provide feedback so that we can approach all of the government funders together uh, with a cohesive message on the vision, all be behind it and not have last minute conversations uh, like this. So I look forward to engaging first in, in discussion about your vision, Mark, and that of your staff, getting feedback from us and other stakeholders, and then moving forward with a budget that will support uh, what the vision is for, for moving forward. I believe you had a comment. Thank you. I'm in support of the budget. Um, I do want the board to know that I have colleagues in the uh, faith community, the B Black church faith community in particular, that are highly involved with the tiny house villages. And I just want to make sure that we find a way that they could access the information so that they can have access to funding as it relates to these uh, city provisos. I think it's very um, important, and I think that the Black community needs to have access to these funds as well so that we can support those in our communities. Thank you. Um, are there other questions or comments as we... Uh move towards uh, approving the, or uh, considering budget. I'll, like I'll make a motion chair to pass the budget uh, as presented by staff with, with the, uh, and sent to the governing committee. And do we have a second? Second. Thank you. Um, well, I think this should be by a roll call vote. You can go through that, Naomi. That's all in favor of approving the um, uh, KCRJ 2022 budget. Naomi, are you there? Yeah. I can what? run. So? I'm, right. I'm back. I decided to get a charger for Harold. Um, okay, Carrie Anderson? Yes. 
Nate Caminos. Yes. Paula Carvalho. Yes. John Chalmanak. Gordon McHenry. Yes. Harold Odom. Harold Odom. I'll be right back. Damien Patna. Yes. Adrian Quinn. Yes. Michael Ramos. Yes. Sarah Rankin. Simha Reddy. Yes. When needed spot when needed spotted elk. Um, yes. Harold Odom. You are on mute, Harold. Sorry. Can we count reading lips? Yes. All right, thumbs up. Thumbs up. <laughs> perhaps yeah all right hey we got two votes from harold <laughs> we have 10 yays zero nays and zero abstains well folks we have our very first budget congratulations everybody thank you to the rha staff and the city of seattle and king county um we're just reaching 320 we're back on time it looks like um our next order of business is to hear an update from um, KCRJ sub-regional planning manager, Alex Mercedes Rank, about the recent severe weather uh, response. So thank you, Alexis, for joining us. Thank you for having me. I'm gonna quickly share my screen. All right, obligatory, can folks see my screen? All right, I'm seeing nodding and thumbs up. Wonderful. Good afternoon, everyone. It is great to be in virtual community with you. I'm here today to speak on our regional severe weather response, and I'll be focused specifically on North, East, and South King County, as well as the Snoqualmie Valley in this presentation, as those are the subregions that the subregional planning team was leading coordination on for the most recent severe weather event. I'd like to share, uh, just as a note for a bit of background, we started conversation around severe weather shelter planning with sub-regional tables in October of last year and had been planning with the expectation that our first severe weather event would likely happen sometime in January. And as we now know, that was not the case. And I just wanna lead into this presentation with a lot of lessons learned and our team is already working to generate system improvements in anticipation of severe weather events for the rest of winter. And so leading into that, when we look at our landscape of severe weather in these various subregions, we're really talking about existing emergency shelters, existing emergency shelters that expand capacity in response to severe weather shelter. And then we also have severe weather shelters that stand up and have varying um, activation points, which we'll talk about in a bit. We're also looking at warming centers and then public spaces that function as warming centers, specifically King County library locations, city halls and community centers. So geographically, just a little bit about what this looks like. Red, oops, pardon me. Uh, red indicates a severe weather shelter. Blue indicates an existing emergency shelter. Uh, again, a number of which expand capacity in response to severe weather. Um, green indicates a King County Library location. Orange indicates uh, space operating as a warming site, so city hall or a community center. And lastly, yellow indicates a pending severe weather locations. So these are sites that um, are looking to support future severe weather events that um, my team is in conversation with right now, but did not activate during the most recent severe weather event. And so looking at just by the numbers, um, this Seattle, Seattle had six severe weather sites scanned up. That's just severe weather sites. In South King County, we had 12 sites operating. So again, a combination of severe weather and existing emergency shelters. In East King County, we had seven sites with two safe parking group programs utilizing hotel vouchers. Um, in North King County, we had three sites operating with one city offering vouchers. And then in Snoqualmie Valley, we had one site operating. 
a little bit more just looking by the numbers throughout the course of the event, we had 27 different sites operating by 19 different operators and subregions outside of Seattle. When we fully activated, we were over 900 units available and this includes rooms and beds. Um, over 260 of those were severe weather specific shelter expansions or spaces. I wanna highlight a data limitation that we have on this point is that uh, we know that hotel rooms were heavily utilized throughout the course of the event um, with several cities and providers um, offering hotel vouchers and, and hoteling folks. And we're still waiting on some of those numbers. So we're working on getting that so we can just have a full complete picture of just how many folks were, were um, sheltered throughout the course of the event. So, um, Throughout the course of the event, the severe weather event, we monitored for about 10 days, starting with the initial activation. In the days leading up to the weekend, we had starts, sites start activating on the 23rd and people starting to be placed in hotels. Um, the day after Christmas through the 29th was really our peak of the severe weather event um, with an additional uh, six severe weather sites that were activated during that time, the majority of those being in South King County. And then the 30th through the 1st, we had um, deactivation of sites with 22 sites operating on that final day. And so this graph highlights, you know, our severe weather unit availability throughout the event. The blue net line signifies the total number of available units on a given day in subregions outside of Seattle. And the yellow line indicates our utilization. Overall, we had about an 80% utilization rate and you can see a bit of breadth between those two lines. Many of the sites had a bit of additional space. Um, and, but also many were at capacity with just one organization to our knowledge actually going above capacity. So as, as far as, as my team is aware, nobody was turned away uh, in this severe weather incident. Um, I do wanna highlight that at the very end of, of this timeline, you can see as we approach the first, you see um, with the wind down of shelters, you can see those li two lines cross in a very uh, frustrating, disappointing way as many sites began closing, but the need remained steady throughout. So throughout the course of the severe weather event, our team showed up in a few ways. We coordinated daily calls um, with for each subregion, and these calls included um, city partners from local jurisdictions, all of our severe weather emergency shelter providers, advocates, and our faith partners. Um, and throughout these calls, we would often kind of do a round robin and just check in, talk about um, how many folks folks were being served, um, if staff were having any issues coming, coming in and how they were really doing, um, if there were needs around food, if there were needs around PPE and testing, and if they were seeing symptomatic cases, what their relationship and, and just uh, communications had been with public health throughout the course of the event. Um, we also um, provided some support to, to newly stood up severe weather sites, we um, assisted in activating some of our food access and justice networks, name, namely nourishing networks on the east side, um, who was able to bring in some um, additional meals. As one thing that we found throughout the severe weather event is that a lot of shelters that uh, rely on their community to, to donate meals, a lot of those folks who would have been donating meals were unable to get out of their driveways and deliver said, said food. And so we were able to activate some really powerful networks to help get uh, food into um, our shelters. Um, I'd also highlight we also had delivery of materials, so we were able to actually assist um, with bringing in materials um, from socks to also meals to a, a number of shelters throughout the course of the event. To highlight some of the challenges that have popped, have really arisen throughout this process. Transportation continues to be a major challenge as we're looking at transportation of not only staff to and from their home and, and where they're working, the, the shelters, um, but then also um, being able to transport, uh, transport guests um, from, from day centers back to shelter for, for the evening. Um, I'd also highlight, as I referenced just a second ago, food and meal access um, was a challenge throughout this. And while we were able to address the the situations as they arose, um, that, that was something I'd like to uplift today. The holiday weekend posed tremendous challenges as um, the holiday weekend meant many city hall locations and King County Library locations were, were closed, eliminating a lot of like indoor daytime space that otherwise would have been available. Um, we also, as, as was uplifted earlier by, by Mark, um, staffing continues to be a tremendous, tremendous challenge um, with a number of staff then leading into the second piece, um, staff coming back from the holiday and having experienced some Omicron exposure or exposure even within the shelter space. 
as just some next steps, um, we're right now undergoing some debriefs with subregional tables, um, just talking about what went well, what went, what could be done better. Um, we are working on improving our communication planning and coordination with public health, as well as King County Metro and other transportation partners, such as Hopelink, as well as the city emergency management offices around the region. We're going to be reconnecting with our, the, the sites that activated in the most recent session to um, really confirm their participation for the rest of the winter season um, and really identify strategies to support um, our workforce and volunteer base. And so as I close out and pass it back over to Mark in the chair. I also just want to close with some gratitude to the providers and volunteers that served throughout this event, who were on calls with me and my team on Christmas Day, who navigated this tremendously challenging situation on top of crises and crises. Just a huge thank you for those who are on the call. And um, with that, I am happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much, Alexis. Um, I think a couple of questions came up in the chat, um, but were there other uh, questions that folks had now for Alex? Um, I, I dropped a note in the chat that I can respond more broadly to the issue of, of closures. Um, so uh, folks have not had to close um, so simultaneously to the work that Alexis described, there were also uh, six severe weather shelters in Seattle. Part of the reason why Alexis didn't speak to Seattle is Alexis handled the subregions. I, I took Seattle Metro along with uh, my colleague Alex Ibrahimi. Um, and so the, the six sites in Seattle um, uh, had um, a combined capacity for about 300 folks. Um, there, uh, I, I will say, you know, a significant shout out to um, uh, HSD Interim Director Tanya Kim, uh, who worked with me uh, and another member of our staff to actually wind down the um, Seattle City Hall shelter um, on Monday of last week. Uh, we were both there in person um, doing that work, uh, which I'm happy to talk to any of you about offline. There are some interesting things. Um, but um, uh, I want to be really uh, clear that the, the difficulty that the, the whole system is facing is staffing related. Um, we can fund most stuff, um, but we can't fund, what we can't fund is people's wages above what they're at now, which is what we need to be doing, right? Um, and so uh, Alexis can speak to, you know, um, uh, again, some of the, the sub-regional uh, details, but broadly across the, the county, um, post-severe weather, as the surge increased, people quit again, just to be very transparent. Um, and uh, the, uh, you know, when, when I connected with provider managers and uh, directors to say, you know, what was it, right? It was, you know, I'm two years into this, I'm still making $27,000 a year, I can't do this to my family anymore, I can't have this kind of risk, you know, and not, so it, it is, it's the very straightforward reality of a, a system that has been underfunded for 30 years, running up against, you know, concurrent existential crises. <laughs> um, and so, you know, we, we, I'm very proud of the work that that the team, the authority did, um, and very proud of the the work that folks in homelessness services across the region did over the last uh, three weeks. I have deep concern about whether or not it is sustainable. Um, Harold, did you have a comment or question? Yeah. Um, so, a couple of things. Thank you, Mark, and thank you, Alexis. Uh, so next month, you're going to hear from uh, Lived Experience Coalition because we are going to be facilitating a outreach um, kind of learning circle, but not learning circle, interagency group that we had going on until COVID hit, which is very much a lot of um, outreach workers coming together and seeing what we can do. And a lot of it is not on, on the paycheck. Um, because they have a heart for this, and it's a it's a blessing. I call the two of my angels um, from Reach, um, uh, Brenda and Yvonne. They saved me, and they came up, you know, where I was embedded deeply 
And I was so mad at them that they came up there, but you know, they have a love of, of outreach and they do this because they were there and now they need to get back. And I, I so many workers, um, we have a Wednesday call had this morning, are there because they know they're not gonna get paid, but they know people need help. So any way we can do, Mark, that we can push this forward. I mean, I'm there for you, but we need to use other groups that are out there. And truth to power be told, if, it hasn't, if there hasn't been a wage, a wage increase in 10 years for outreach workers, why is there a wage for chief executive officers? And why is there a wage for managers in those same agencies? Um, I won't go there right now, but that's a question that needs to be asked and answered in a more than a uh, talking point way. Um, but I th thank you, Alexis. And I, I, we're going to be working together, I think, over the next month to do this with those um, agencies. And I, because I want to go throughout King County and we're going to need support, but I think you're not going to have as much funding uh, questions, Mark, as you might think you might have. Because I think a lot of these people are going to be volunteering and summer's coming up. And maybe we should think now about stockpiling some things around the county. And I've always said um, um, cold weather stations should be on main roads that they plow first and not any on the back road. So those are my two cents. Uh, Gordon, I see your hand raised. Yeah, thank you. I really appreciate this presentation. Um, it's very timely, maybe a little bit late, not that's not a criticism because we're already in the winter, but you know, there's always winter, but it's very timely in terms of uh, the environmental conditions and the humanity uh, that we're most concerned about. Uh, I have a question in terms, and I, so I appreciate uh, the work that's been done. Uh, I appreciate the focus uh, by Mark and Alexis and the team and the volunteers. If we were, if or when we have another cold weather event of similar um, severity and duration, based upon what you've just experienced and what you've just learned, um, what parts of the county uh, from a geographic perspective, if nothing were to change, what parts of the county from a geographic perspective are most vulnerable? Like, oh, I know we're gonna need to do you know, better in this area or to Harold's point, uh, we've got some services, but they're on back roads. So we gotta find a way to get them. You know, So I'm just sort of curious as, you, as we think about the, the region, the county. Um, and so perhaps that's first for Alexis to answer and then Mark, because I, 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 um, I, I'm also curious about um, geographic areas that are outside the city of Seattle where there is, a, a, relatively speaking, more funding and resources than others. Thank you. Thank you for that question. Um, a bit of a, a spicy one. And so I am hesitant to answer, but I do want to share, you know, I, I would uplift um, South King County particularly, and it was mentioned by um, Board Chair Ramos earlier, the faith community steps up tremendously to serve this need. Many of the severe weather sites that were stood up in South King County were faith-based. We are checking in with those sites to, to talk about their, their experiences and if they're willing to do it again. And if they're not, then I would be tremendously concerned about our ability to frankly serve that subregion. And I'd also like to highlight right now, Snoqualmie Valley uh, only has one emergency shelter. And while they manage throughout the season, they just disproportionately get, get um, piled on with snow. And so they often have to be operating under you know, severe weather conditions for a bit longer. So just also concerned about that as well. Thank you. Um, if I can uh, enter, uh, or not, not intervene. Please work. Yeah. I'm very tired. <laughs> um, it's also like my 20 something day of working story. And so like things are starting to fade for me. <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, I don't think it's as spicy a question. I will say I'm significantly concerned about the, our Southeast subregion. The infrastructure is not there. Um, and the, uh, you know, the, the weather hits harder, <laughs> right? So like, so we actually have a significant amount of work to do there. Um, they are great partners, right? I want, I want to be really clear. The issue is not partnership. The issue is not willingness. It is about, uh, uh, you know, an, a lack of the base infrastructure necessary in terms of buildings and agencies, right? Like, 
uh, the Snoqualmie Valley essentially operates a single year round shelter, right? Um, it used to only be a winter shelter, but went year round actually uh, at the onset of, of COVID. So, so we are talking about just like a, a, a lack of the, the stuff and the spaces that we normally open. Um, but I wanna be really clear to me why that isn't a spicy question is we're not saying someone is doing a bad job. We're saying like, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of work and investment necessary in order to bring uh, the, the resources to scale. Um, the thing that I, I wanted to add, and, and you know, I, I appreciate um, uh, uh, board member McHenry raising like, you know, the, it's, it would have been better <laughs> to have, I, like, everything would have been great if I had just sort of been hired a year ago, right? Like, <laughs> like that just would have been the ideal situation. Um, and so we're going to do what we can um, to shift protocols and learn from what we just learned before February, right? That, like that's what we're now sort of scrambling to do. Um, uh, I think that um, we are, are very interested and I'll just preview this uh, for the board. I, I've, I've spoken about this with some of our um, uh, city colleagues of, across the region already. Um, we are, are likely to try to implement something that's more tiered in structure um, so that we are thinking about ramping in and out of severe weather events instead of on and off. Um, we want to be um, cognizant of the fact that uh, exposure deaths actually begin around 45, 40 degrees, particularly if it's quite wet. Um, and so by the time you hit 30, 25, right? Like you've already been in a risky area for a while. Um, and so expanding auxiliary warming capacity and auxiliary hygiene capacity when you're in those uh, uh, you know, temperature ranges where the risk is there, but we're not yet at a declared overall lethality outside, I think it's gonna be really important. And then certainly, right, like I, I, um, I think we wanna really take the opportunity to think about how in the context of any severe weather event, that's an opportunity to connect with people who may not normally uh, you know, be inside a shelter space and see what they need and see if we can do a better job providing it so that we can get them on a path to housing. Um, and then the third thing uh, is, uh, you know, and I, I'm gonna, this I think is a little risky to be honest, we need to do a better job of, of supporting people who, who shelter in place, right? Like many, many people for a variety of reasons do not have access to or don't want to avail themselves, right? Of the severe weather shelters. Most commonly that decision is because we aren't able to provide places for people's stuff, right? Like, so the, the decision that they're faced is do I potentially lose my possession? Like, you know, it's a life, life worth, worth of stuff, right? To be in a severe weather shelter that isn't typically 24 seven, right? So that means like, I might have to go somewhere else during the day to a warming center or something like that, right? Um, or should I just stay where I am? Um, and one of the things that we were able to do over the course of this last event was uh, disperse funding directly to the LEC and directly um, to uh, uh, a vehicle residency program to support harm reduction activity for shelter in place via food and blankets and hand warmers and socks and that. We need to do much more of that and we need to do it better and we need to anticipate that it is necessary. I, pre I appreciate that, and I, I dropped in the chat, and, um, um, you know, being a, a longtime Seattle native, we now have a recurring severe weather in the summer, and so I think Alexis and Mark's observations about infrastructure, about staff, about volunteers, about dependency on unpaid, low paid, no pay, is also relevant when the heat uh, gets excessive uh, during the summer months, not just in the uh, winter months, and I want to make sure that I actually entered this conversation framing it in terms of cold weather, snow and ice. And I really should have said when we when we encounter severe weather, whenever, um, how do we, how are we prepared? How do we ramp up? How do we ramp down? So thank you for that. And um, I step back now, thanks. I wanna raise up just a couple of comments from uh, the chat, um, uh, reinforcing what you had mentioned, Gordon, about the importance of thinking about um, not just cold weather, but you know, uh, wildfires, as like I mentioned, uh, for example, smoke season, uh, a lot of severe weather events. Um, 
And then uh, uh, Board Member Ramos had also uh, provided a thoughtful comment about the importance of ensuring we have a good qualitative evaluation uh, at the end of the season to, to figure out what we've what lessons to, to draw um, to use for uh, the future. Right. Other thoughts or comments? Mark, Alexis, and the rest of the RHA staff. And, and oh, I'm sorry, Juanita. Please. Um, since we're talking about um, severe weather conditions all, all year round, um, what would happen if we was to have a natural disaster? Um, how would how is would that be something part of this work? And I I'm thinking like an earthquake or something. Because I know we've been having flooding in different areas, and so um, that's just something that comes natural. And I've read in articles that it's not if, it's when. And so my thing is like, what would, how would that work? Like thank disaster you. planning? Yeah, thank you, board member. So we are um, actually uh, in. Oh, at this point, like weekly-ish <laughs> communication um, with the uh, uh, offices of emergency management um, with the, the city and the, and the county um, and are in the process of um, being fully integrated into the uh, incident response command structure um, for both, um, you know, uh, time constrained events like weather, um, but then also uh, the tabletop planning for exactly what you're talking about, which is, you know, some sort of catastrophic event like an earthquake or a significant flooding event. Um, we uh, also, I, I get now um, daily updates uh, from the National Weather Service around, uh, you know, potential forecast uh, issues, inclusive of landslides and, and other um, results of, of inclement weather um, that allow us to, to begin to forecast where we might be needed. Um, but I, you know, I think that um, the broader point here that I think is, is coming to the fore is, you know, homelessness is a crisis, right? And actually has to be responded to and thought of at every angle like one, right? Um, and it is not a bureaucratic exercise, right? It is why, it is why I was the one in person winding down a, a shelter and helping to transition people to other spaces because that actually is the work of this agency, right? Um, and so uh, we need to be really clear that one of the things that we uh, as staff at the authority and then uh, you all as our, our uh, you know, appointed leadership are, are shepherding a culture change, right? About how this work is thought of, what necessary policy connections are necessary in order to do it well, um, and what it looks like. Thank you. Any other final comments or questions? I, I wanted to ask Damien, how are the schools and, and how is it affecting any of the uh, children who are um, attending schools in your area? Well, I would say first is that the overlapping of, well, obviously we're talking about cold weather and the impact there, and then you just lay on Omicron and folks being sick and oftentimes in multi-generational homes. And so just a, a, a huge challenge. And then the challenge we face as a school system in our specific location is that we work with seven different uh, municipalities. And so trying to work with both the city of Renton, unincorporated King County, Bellevue is a Kwa Kent, um, just the coordination of efforts is a challenge. And that's why uh, a board like this one and the work that's being led by uh, Mark is, is so critical so that we can have the regional approach to better serve not only the kids here in Renton, but more broadly. But I will say that in school districts right now, it's all about, can we keep schools open? <laughs> and that whole thing um, with staff staffing shortages that mirror exactly what we're talking hearing about uh, for different reasons, but um, it's, it's a multifaceted pandemic that we're wrestling with right now. I and mean, then you overlay on snow and ice makes it all the more challenging. Thank you for that. Thank you very much. Um, well, we only have 15 minutes left or less than 15 minutes left. Um, there are two things that I think would be, uh, okay. Um, 
Well, it looks like uh, Mark will need to leave at exactly four. Um, wondering if we can get just a brief update. I think you'd already alluded to this, like the staffing issues associated with Omicron and just in general, how we're trying to approach um, supporting our, uh, supporting people in this moment around COVID and Omicron. Yeah, and I apologize. I just, I was invited to address the regional policy committee, which is a sure. critical regional policy body. <laughs> I, I, I want to be on time. <laughs> um, uh, so um, the, uh, Issues around um, the uh, COVID-19 surge are, are really substantive. And I, I sent a communication to you all, but um, for the good of the, uh, of the public and so everyone can hear, um, the first thing is just that we have a, a, a critical staffing shortage across the entire system, as everyone does, right? But like, it is, um, it is quite significant. We are, we are um, managing shelters with, um, you know, a person a shift, which is not not good. Um, and uh, we are in the process of developing a pooled staffing uh, uh, apparatus across all providers so that we can help sort of shuttle staff around to, to cover those shortages. Um, we're contracting with uh, temp and surge staffing agencies to try to uh, support folks. Um, I'm approving emergency funding disbursements so that we can shore up um, people's uh, overtime. Uh, you know, people have maxed on overtime over the last uh, couple months, um, and so have uh, gone significantly over what their projected budgets are. Uh, you know, it's just it is broadly a, a, a mess. <laughs> like, and it, and it's not because people aren't managing well. It's that like you know this is. This is again the result of, of 30 years of chronic underfunding, and then these existential crises stacked on top of it. Um, and so, uh, you know, if we're going to get through another anything, we have to prioritize workforce stabilization, pipeline, and pay. Um, and I appreciate what uh, Board Chair Odom is saying about a lot of people do free work. I don't think people should do free work. I, I think that this is important work that our community needs and we need to compensate it as such. Um, we are also uh, seeing significant uh, issues around um, uh, just the risk level that our, our folks have broadly um, because of uh, significant comorbidity, often as a result of the experience of, of homelessness, right? Like, and so we need to be very aware that the, the possibility for disease progression is high. We also, you know, I've, I've received um, a number of emails at this point from healthcare providers and hospitals um, looking for places to discharge people to, right? Who are, you know, they don't need to be in an ED, they don't need to be admitted, they might actually still be COVID positive, right? Um, and there is nowhere for them to go. Um, and uh, we, again, we don't have the, the capacity in place um, in order to um, uh, support folks. Um, uh, board member Spotted Elka in the chat says, why can't they have uh, motels help? So we did um, over the last uh, week, um, we as the authority um, started uh, placing people in hotel motels um, who were COVID positive, but weren't moving to INQ in some situations. Um, and either uh, uh, emergency authorizing funding at agencies or, you know, in some cases, uh, working directly with the uh, establishment, um, you know, to be, to be candid, uh, that uh, around Friday, um, those same hotels and motels that we had identified um, that could that that had you know a history of working with folks experiencing homelessness started declining to take new people um, in part because you know they started to have concerns about wait all these you know potentially COVID positive folks or known COVID positive folks are are coming in um, and their staff started saying like you know this is not what we signed up for right. Um, and so uh, that, that path has largely closed to us. Um, there is the potential, um, you know, depending on how uh, the latest UW model predicts peak, I think uh, next week, um, depending on how long the, the tail end runs, we may consider master leasing some spaces for a month uh, or more in order to facilitate, again, having places for people to go. 
Um, but it is, uh, it's quite bad. Uh, and then, you know, related to that is, and, and coming off of that, the uh, issue for um, isolation and, and quarantine and care, um, we've worked really extensively with the Salvation Army over the last um, uh, 72-ish hours to create um, some additional capacity uh, at SOTO to um, care for people who don't have uh, an I and Q need, but might need, um, you know, have like more flu-like symptoms. Um, we are working really, really extensively um, uh, with, again, all our providers to keep an eye on the situation at all times. We threw together a, a sort of emergency Sunday call, 40 people logged on, like that is the state of the, the panic right now, right? Um, and we just are all trying to get through it together um, by being communi communicative, over communicating, working really well together. Um, Director Floor at the, at the county has been a tremendous partner. Um, I cannot speak highly enough, uh, frankly, of um, how uh, adept and capable and helpful he has been during this, like, you know, we're trying to on-ramp an agency, approve a budget, <laughs> and then manage all these crises, and I could not have asked for a better partner in that moment. Um, our own staff, again, Alexis and Peter um, Sparrow, uh, who I don't believe you all have had the opportunity to meet, Helen Howell, um, you know, have all been in it in, in various ways. Um, we implemented uh, two weeks ago a duty officer role so that someone on the leadership team is available 24 seven every day of the week um, in order to answer calls, triage emergencies, activate the rest of the team if needed, um, but you know, make emergency approval so that providers can always get someone here to get what they need. Um, and so we are, we are just continuing to, to step into again, our clear understanding that this is a crisis that needs to be managed as such. Um, but, but uh, you know, as uh, board member Quinn points out in the chat, right, um, we are just not resourced uh, like an emergency management agency, right? So um, I, I absolutely believe that one of the budget recommendations that I will be making in, you know, about two months um, is for us to have some, you know, sort of emergency fund that if I come to you all and say, I need you to authorize me to use the emergency money, that I then have broad flexibility with a pot of money to respond to an emergency, right? And, I, and it should just be for emergencies, right? It shouldn't become some fun to do, you know, oh, well, we have that emergency money, let's do that, you know, like, it really needs to be, like, set aside and activated in that way. Mark, thank you for that update. I know it's an enormous crisis and I'm glad to hear you guys are doing your best. Um, we only have five minutes left, folks. And let me, you know, we had hoped to, to talk about uh, board structure and committees. Let me make a proposal, if you don't mind. Um, last spring, uh, uh, then Chair uh, Nate uh, and Harold had, um, uh, proposed the creation of a four subcommittee structure that included, um, gosh, oh, why did it disappear on me just in just this moment? Um, sorry, a work plan and performance committee, um, a budget committee, a system planning committee, and then a communication board development committee. And we've talked in you know, several sessions about these, um, whether these are the right, this, the right uh, group of committees uh, for us to, to start to form. I'm wondering whether this uh, group would be, would be open to approving creation of those committees now, and then allowing us to um, sort of, Multiple people have already expressed great interest in, in volunteering for different committees, and we can set up the, the timing structure, et cetera, um, offline or off. Nate? Or we can arrange, we can either extend this board meeting time yeah. or back to next month. Yeah, thanks, Chair Reddy. And since uh, I think we started about 10 minutes later, so for today's meeting, and so I'm happy to stay 10 minutes or even longer, honestly, because we've been talking about doing this since, and just to yeah. maybe a clarifier to your point too, I put in the, the link and for the uh, viewing public, if you look on our KCRHA implementation board meeting 
uh, materials back from our May 12, 2021 meeting, you'll see a document that states KCRJ IB officers and committees uh, and in that board meeting uh, on May on May 12th, we had already voted to approve uh, the creation cool. of those committees chair uh, in that regard. And so I think the, the actionable item, as I see it, uh, is essentially the work that you and Chair Odom have already been doing in this past week or even maybe longer in the way that you've reached out to us to assess um, uh, what areas and which committees are of interest in the way that we can really start to uh, fill those uh, Rightfully, and also to get to your point, uh, start to really schedule those out. Uh, and just wanting to, as a reminder, uh, a month ago now, or two months ago, when we even wanted to resurrect this discussion, um, two things. One is to understanding that we've heard from Mark and staff the strong recommendation that while the staff uh, has definitely been staffed up to be present here and supporting the work of the authority, obviously we have a lot of work here and we saw a lot of uh, angles and ways in which these committee structures could be helpful in working alongside staff in that manner. And, and why not now, right? One of these, as you mentioned before, we talked about today, uh, and we've shared with one of my colleagues here on the board, is the budget committee itself. Uh, we don't yet have a treasurer uh, as our kind of guiding leader there, uh, an executive committee of this structure, but also a com budget committee that would, that would include uh, everyone's input that we've shared here two hours, once a month, uh, 12 times a year uh, and the way that we can be a little bit more regular and hands-on about that, what that spring uh, coordination is, uh, not with just the city of Seattle's annual funding, but recognizing that the county is about to do their biannual budget uh, this year as well. So there's a lot of synergy and work there. I think it's just a matter of like, are we getting hands raised for folks to fill in these committee slots uh, and identifying a regular cadence structure for staff to help schedule us out in the weeks and months ahead. Thank you, Nate. Really appreciate that. And I apologize for missing that the uh, uh, committees had already been approved. Um, of the, the rest of the board, um, is there anyone who needs to jump off right now or can we take another 10 minutes or so? Patrick Carey, you do. Okay. Um, Patrick Carey, I think you had already mentioned a couple of uh, boards that you need to join, but uh, he sent that to me separately via email and we'll, we'll make sure to, to add him in there. Well, why don't we take it? So actually the other piece is the executive committee members. Um, there are two really important pieces. One is the secretary, one is the treasurer that would round out our executive committee. Um, we've had some interest in the secretary position, but uh, have not heard back from anybody about the treasurer position uh, quite yet, although we're missing a couple of board members. Is there anyone who is particularly interested in the treasurer position now? I think having those positions filled would, would aid us here. And it's not necessary that we approve that today. That is something that we can do at the next visit. Is that, is that your hand raised, Nate? Are you volunteering? What's that? What's that? I said Nate's hand is raised. Is he volunteering? Sorry, I didn't lower my hand from earlier. My apologies. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, Michael. Yeah, I, I'm concerned about short-circuiting the process that requires more discussion. I'm sorry, um, did you? I, I, I think there needs to be more discussion and the framing of the committees and also the secretary and treasurer positions. Um, I'm happy to stay on for nine more minutes, but I, I think that people are volunteering for different committees and if you want to take up the secretary and treasurer and nail that down, some people who fill those roles may not be as available to be on another subcommittee. So I'm just, so by the sequencing and then, you know, we'll do what we can do today. And then if we can approve committees, then we could staff them or get people signed up in between this meeting and the next one, perhaps. Okay. <laughs> well, we do have the committees approved. Um, at this point, we can, between now and next session, work offline to um, gather together the, um, to kind of collate the, the different uh, interests and then try to come up with times to work for people for each of these different subcommittees. Does that sound reasonable to people? And we can take up um, 
this board's meeting um, the good uh, half, the first half of the second half to really dial some things in. We really need to um, have this board come together in those committees and subcommittees and start some listening sessions. And I think with the budget now beyond, we should maybe have a half a meeting on just ourselves and what we need to do with the implementation board and um, do some talks in between time, but um, next meeting, just uh, let's focus on the implementation board and what we need to um, accomplish and maybe a year goals some goals throughout the year as well. How does that sound? Makes sense. Um, Juanita, see your hand raised. Um, I just want to agree um, because we only do a one a month, one time a month meeting. Is it possible for us to meet again and just do go deeper, dive into all this? And I think, you know, it's very critical. And my concern, and this was one of the questions that Mark asked about um, if there was an area, and because I'm new to all this, um, I some leadership training, you know, and I know we had different things and I missed some portions, so I'm not. I have to get caught up on this subcommittee and even just the crisis, what Mark said about the severe weather conditions and really uh, brainstorm and do all that good stuff that everyone, you know, um, in organizing and communication. And um, for me, I, I appreciate teachers and I think everyone here is a teacher for me um, and especially Harold, because um, from the beginning on, I watched him. <laughs> <laughs> because of my trauma can get the best of me sometimes <laughs> it gets messy but I'm learning so um I just want to not be intimidated because sometimes I can you know with yeah. inferiority complex I can feel like maybe I'm not good enough or yeah. I don't know yeah. anyway that's my thinking thank you for that feedback Juanita. and Nate I see your hand raised yeah, just in terms of your the chair's suggestions here from you and Chair Oldham, and just building on uh, board member Juanita Spotted Elk's uh, uh, recommendation to, you know, I think I've been maybe lax uh, as a previous co-chair uh, in trying to figure out in, in earnest uh, that we would have some dedicated time for each month to be able to focus on these conversations. Uh, let's be honest, even today, uh, we had a packed agenda on expected and unexpected items that are taking us a, a past the four o'clock hour to, to discuss that. We, we honestly have the challenge to of being faced of being a board that was established and has since been operating where I'm literally looking at a laptop the entire time I meet my, and I've worked with all of you for more than a year and a half. And yeah. just to put it in the public light, we've, we've, this has been a challenge for co-chairs in coordination with Mark and staff about uh, what might be possible and bringing us together uh, outside of these monthly meetings in a form of a potential retreat where we really would allow ourselves to not han be handcuffed by the time or constraints uh, to really to, you know, uh, board member Ramos's point, uh, really put a time and attention to talk through these subcommittees in a way that they were crafted when we were still being supported by King County and City of Seattle staff, uh, but are obviously in a very different place even now uh, several months later uh, in, in kicking off 2022. So um, maybe to sum up my points in terms of a form of a recommendation is I would also put our, uh, whatever timeline in terms of a hard date for board members to get back to you co-chairs and staff mm -hmm. on any committee uh, ideas of interest uh, and as well as any other recommendations uh, for those committee discussions. Uh, but I hope that uh, we can be work to be helpful to identify a Saturday after hours, any time that will be helpful for us to get together in smaller groups or larger groups, uh, or even as uh, committees of interest to talk through what we think uh, uh, these committees really should be beyond these bulleted items that are in here in a two page document. Thank you, Nate. I think you know, you a retreat in the next within the next month that people can attend might be tricky, but I, I would certainly be open to it um, or having, so I, I guess it sounds like what you're suggesting is that we have an additional meeting between now and next session. Um, Anytime to, that might be feasible or possible virtual in some virtual manner, I would say. 
uh, understand SNAP. We've been looking at what our, even our other local government counterparts have been doing in, the, in a similar format to um, be under, I'd be curious to hear what the best practices are and what might be applicable for us. What is an additional ask for, of the, uh, the board, but um, Six, two, is there anyone who, uh, I, I'm curious as to the board members thoughts as to whether it's an additional session between now and next month so that we can actually spend the time that that's needed to clarify what the role of each committee is to um, ensure that we're all really on the same page. So this group should be um, quite um, used to having special, I mean, we had how many, four special meetings last year from this time to, to maybe we had six, I think, from this time to March. Yeah, uh, so I think one, two hours, one meeting in between now and February's meeting uh, for two hours just to go over the committees and who wants to be on them. And um, maybe the next month we have a um, goal kind of oriented meeting. Um, but we do need to spend more time on ourselves and how we um, are approaching on, and are we doing our, our oversight ability and um, what is our oversight and how do we best address that as well? So I would be, I'd be down for in middle of the month, I mean, in, well, our middle of the month is now. So yeah. at the beginning of the month or so, in, I don't know. Say, so, yeah, right. oh, I was yeah. just gonna, Damien, please. Yeah, I was gonna say, I, I agree. I think a meeting would be necessary. I know for okay. a lot of us, the challenge will be just who's gonna coordinate and get that scheduled based on our, um, how our calendars might look. And given that in a lot of cases, at least in my district, people at the central office are going out to help teach and fill those positions, I just need to know. and. Harold, hearing how great of a teacher you are, I'm sure there are a lot of school districts that would love to have you as a substitute teacher. So just let me know and I can connect you wherever you wanna go. Fantastic. Well, how about this? Um, do I have a motion to um, add an additional meeting between now and next session um, to try to, uh, to further discuss uh, the implementation board itself and, and the subcommittees, et cetera. Um, and we'll ask, um, KCRHA staff, if at all possible, to help coordinate that if so move uh, for people. Seconded. All, right. all in favor? Aye. 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 Any abstentions? All right. Well, we'll let Pastor Carey and John know that they've got another session to do between now and next session. Um, I want to thank everybody for taking the extra 10 minutes here and Nate uh, for your um, uh, guidance on this last little bit here. Thanks, Simha and Harold for the leadership as always. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I think we're going to be going into adjournment. Um, I do want people to think about, um, and maybe we'll just add it on maybe next meeting, um, to have a couple of listening sessions for our, our providers to see uh, maybe what we're missing. Um, so until next time, I believe um, I don't have to ask for a, a motion, do I? Okay, we are adjourned. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>